Welcome. It's, uh, it's, it's my great pride and pleasure to, uh, to welcome you all here today. Uh, Olympus, we believe we're leading the way in um, best practice application of, of this great technology, Portable XRF, and I think this, this workshop's a manifestation of that. Huge thanks to all the speakers, who've, uh, our friends, and who've agreed to, uh, to, to present to you all today. You're going to hear some fantastic stories and um, really learn something, I believe. The other thing I, I would just say today, we're not talking about Portable XRD today, we're only talking about Portable XRF. Uh, I think perhaps that um, we might like to consider doing a portable XRD workshop next year. So if anyone's interested in hearing more about portable XRD, then grab one of us during the day and um, we, can, we can perhaps help you with that. So first speaker is Dennis, Dennis Arne, get it out of the way, Dennis Arne. He's got over 30 years experience as a geologist specialising in geochemistry in a wide range of environments in both the minerals and petroleum industries as an academic and in geological surveys. In recent years he's been involved as a consultant in the development of exploration programs for precious and base metals exploration in Australia, North America, South America and Africa. Spe specifically, this has included contributing to exploration targeting reviews and understanding gold and base metals mineral systems the design, management, interpretation of surficial geochemical surveys, the interpretation of litho lithogeochemical data, preparation of QAQC protocols, reviews of geochemical data quality, and contributions to NI43101 and Jork Valmin technical reports. A special area of interest is the incorporation of field portable analytical instrumentation, such as portable XRF, into exploration programs. He's published extensively in the areas of applied geochemistry, economic geology and thermal history analysis for tectonic and petroleum exploration applications. So I was asked to, to speak specifically about some things to think about if you're looking to report portable XRF data publicly under international reporting codes. So I'm only going to talk about two codes. I'm going to talk about uh, 43101 a little bit because I'm sure you're all familiar with 43101. Uh, those of you that report within uh, the Canadian jurisdictions. I'm going to spend a bit more time talking about the Australian Code, JORC 2012 edition, because I think it's a little more specific and a bit more informative about some of the things you should be thinking about if you're going to be reporting publicly portable XRF data. So I'll, I'll jump right into JORC to begin with. Uh, JORC has three guiding principles in terms of public reporting of ex exploration and resource uh, estimates and uh, ore reserve calculations. One is transparency, that you need to be quite transparent in what you've done and, and try to be non-ambiguous about what you're reporting. Uh, materiality, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, that has, in my mind, it has two definitions. One is, is the information material to your company? Uh, we wouldn't expect Barrick to report portable XRF data, but if you're a junior mining company on the Venture Exchange, you've only got one project and you're reporting portable XRF data, it is quite material to, to your company. And finally, this is probably the most important one, is competence in the material that you're presenting to the public. So, look, I'll just, I'll just uh, reiterate materiality. I won't read all those words. It's too early in the morning to, to hit you with a lot of text. The key points are, isn't material to your company what you're reporting, the portable XRF data? I'm going to show you an example where it was. And have you provided sufficient information to allow a reader to make an informed decision about the data that you presented? And, and really, the detail that you go into depends on how important that portable XRF data is to the overall report. If it's only a passing mention, there's no point in going into a lot of detail on calibrations and, and all the analytical procedures that you follow. So I've, uh, I've removed the name of the company and, and the project to protect the guilty in this instance. This is a press release that came out in November of 2013 on the Australian Stock Exchange. And the company uh, was reporting some drilling results as well as some outcrop results. And you can see they got some quite, quite uh, encouraging results. But uh, what really attracted people's eyes was this uh, reporting of gold data 
from Portable XRF. No, really, the only thing they said about uh, the XRF work that they did was that they used an ITON, and, and then basically they disown everything that they present. So uh, I should point out, in November of 2013, you could sneak under the JORC 2012 guidelines for the, for the, up until the end of 2013 or December 2013, you could report under the previous JORC guidelines. The, the uh, JORC 2012 code kicked in in December of 2013. Uh, so they were just sneaking in under the revisions to the, to the code. So this is a whoops moment. Down, uh, it may be hard to see the, the printing here. Here is start off in November 2013. We're going through to, to January um, 2014. Uh, share price chart, this is obviously a, a penny dreadful stock, but you can see significant percentage movement in the stock. Uh, here's the, the trades down on the bottom row in, in millions of, uh, of transactions. At this point, they released their portable XRF results on November 13th. The, uh, the share price was already starting to ramp up a bit, which often happens with the juniors. Uh, and then it took a, a significant jump on release of those results. These results for this particular junior company were quite material to their share price. And you can see they've, they've reported copper, silver, and gold values. Uh, well, when people in Australia saw that who were familiar with portable XRF, they jumped on top of it right away, and uh, there were complaints made to the Australian Securities Commission that that wasn't uh, a good thing to do. Oh, and I should mention, they also reported some outcrop data as well. Again, here's the gold values. You can see how people would get excited about that, uh, as well as the copper, iron. Here's the interesting column in my mind. They had a fair bit of zinc uh, as well. And the thing about zinc is there's an overlap uh, between one of the excitation uh, shells with gold. And in fact, you can see where we have the highest zinc, there we're getting the highest gold values as well. And in fact, I plotted it up and there's a, there's a decent correlation. There's only five data points, but hey, I'm a geochemist, so that doesn't bother me too much. So here comes the retraction of the gold and silver values. It didn't seem to bother the market because the share price kept increasing. Maybe there was a delay effect in there. Uh, maybe people thought, well, they're probably going to be pretty good even if they're not precise, the numbers that they put out from the XRF. And here is where the company actually released the lab results. And here is what the lab results look like for the drill holes that they reported on. And you can see uh, copper is way off. And in my mind, that's unforgivable because Copper is generally quite robust on portable XRF, uh, but you can see they, they've obviously presented uncalibrated copper data. Silver is actually not that bad, but it's, it's not precise, and it's certainly not accurate compared to the, to the lab results, and no gold at all. So really what they were picking up is the interference from the zinc in the samples, uh, giving them a false gold anomaly. And that resulted in a 20% drop in their share price. So you can see, depending on the company involved, presenting these results publicly can be quite material to the company's share price. I've put, I put up the definition of a competent person under JORC 2012. This is a, uh, another bee in my bonnet uh, because it is subtly different from the definition of a qualified person under NI 43101, which I'll show you a bit later. Uh, the key thing here, well, I'll just draw your attention, five years relevant experience specifically in the style of mineralization or type of deposit upon which you're reporting, and that's a little bit different from what 43101 has, but also they sp specify that you have to have competence in the activity upon which you're reporting. So if you're reporting portable XRF data, you should be competent in the use uh, of the equipment, and we saw from the previous example that the company, uh, their, qual or their competent person in that instance, uh, was obviously not competent or Somebody forgot to, to sign the release before the press release went out. Uh, transparency, just to develop a little bit more on that theme, you, you do need to present as much information uh, about what's gone on uh, in the work that you're reporting, and, in, and you have to be careful not to omit important information that's relevant to the, to the public release. So, for example, even something like 
are, are you presenting data from a calibrated or an uncalibrated instrument it is very important for people to know. That previous example I showed you, there was no indication of they, whether they'd done any calibration, but it was clear when they, when they got the lab results. Well, maybe not so clear. We'll talk about that uh, in terms of sampling issues with portable XRF. Uh, but it's unlikely that the machine was calibrated. So JORC 2012, uh, if, if any of you have seen a, a 2012 JORC release, uh, instead of having a full technical report to support a resource estimation or any sort of publicly reported data, uh, they have something which is called Table 1, uh, which is a very efficient and um, uh, still quite detailed, but an efficient way to get all the relevant information associated with the release of the data uh, out with the release, and these are attached to all press releases now. And they do sp specify the use of handheld XRF instrumentation, so you need to talk about the nature and the quality of the sampling that's occurred, and that applies, of course, to any geochemical or assay data that you're presenting. Uh, and then they, and further, any geophysical tools, spectrometers, handheld XRF instruments, you need to be presenting the parameters used during the analysis, and they give a few examples. I, I think I would, I would add a few more on to that as well, just for the, the sake of thoroughness. So Jork does actually mention XRF. There's no mention of XRF in uh, 43101. So some of the other things that Jork says, and this applies to any data that you're going to present, and there's no reason why it wouldn't apply to portable XRF data, you know, is are the samples appropriate, and, and how was it prepared before it was introduced to the machine? Is it representative of the material that's being sampled? Is it representative of the in-ground material? Are the sample sizes appropriate? And have you done QC, run QC samples? And more importantly, are you getting acceptable levels of accuracy and precision? And this is what I like about the JOR code, is it doesn't just tell you that you should be doing QA, QC. It's telling you that you know, you need to have an acceptable level of accuracy and, and precision. And so you have to then think about what those levels should be. Uh, unfortunately, people seldom report these levels of accuracy and precision. Uh, I think people are more com comfortable doing QAQC protocols than they are in terms of interpreting QAQC data. NI43101, in, in spite of its reputation internationally as being a very prescribed and detailed code. Uh, in fact, a lot of Australians are a little bit scared of doing 43101 reports. Uh, but really, it, it covers off some of the things covered in JORC, but it's a little more vague. But certainly, you have to talk sa about sample preparation and quality control, uh, and relevant information about assaying and analytical procedures, quality assurance actions, and whether you have adequate confidence in the data, and then finally, to provide an opinion about whether you think the data is any good or not. Uh, so not as much detail as in JORC, but the onus is still on the qualified person to make sure the data are good. Uh, and then finally, what, what do you have to be in Canada to be a, a QP? Well, you have to have that five years of experience doing something in the industry, and this is, this is where we have a difference with JORC, I believe, a quite a significant difference, although it's really just a, a subtle difference in the wording. Uh, and then experience relevant to the subject matter. So if you're reporting portable XRF, you should have some experience in portable XRF. Notice it's decoupled from the amount of time. So uh, as long as you've been doing geology for five years and you have a bit of experience with portable R XRF, you're, you, you would be considered a QP under 43101. So let's talk about sampling a little bit because, of course, it doesn't matter how well we calibrate the instrument or how long we run the samples, or how much QAQC we do, if we don't have a good sample, we're just wasting our time. So I'd like to go through just a few examples about sampling, then I'll talk a little bit about instrumentation in QAQC, and then I think I'm going to be out of time. So I, I don't expect you to, to see what the numbers are here, but this is a typical sampling, sampling chart of sample mass on the y-axis versus maximum grain size on the x-axis, and you can see sampling theory allows us to predict the size of sample that we would expect to have. The lines here represent different types of grades for different styles of mineralization. Uh, and this has been around for a while, and so as geologists we know if we're looking at something that has a nuggety distribution in drill core or outcrop, 
we need to have a large sample mass. So really, we can't forget that just because we're using a portable XRF, and I think we often do. And as I said, if you have a poor sample, then everything afterwards is, is a wasted effort. So that begs the question, well, how, how big could a portable XRF sample be? So I've, I've done some back-of-the-envelope calculations as to what kind of sample mass we might be analyzing when we do a portable XRF analysis. And this is really the, the critical depth of penetration, the, the effective depth into a sample that you're going to be able to obtain data for. This is dependent on the atomic mass, so this is going to vary depending on what elements you're looking at and also the density of the material. So I, I've, I've picked a number for purposes of calibration, which is probably a bit on the conservative side. Something like phosphate would probably be less than that, uh, but some of your uh, heavier elements like gold, it's probably one or two uh, orders of magnitude too low. But you can see if you do a spot analysis, you're basically looking at a, a square centimeter. You're really sampling less than 0.1 of a gram. So it's a very small sample, and that's important to remember. So uh, the way a lot of people get around this, well, let's do, let's do a whole bunch of spot analysis and take an average. So you, if you do 10, well, we're up to about 0.15 grams in this case. Or we can do a drag of, of the, uh, the analyzer across the core and, and take a continuous read. So maybe getting up to about 1.5 grams. Or you could take a fill, what I call a fillet sample, which is to use a, a, essentially a, um, an angle grinder and capture the material that comes off it and, uh, and collect that and analyze that. So you've got, you've got uh, grain size reduction and your sample mass is getting up, so almost 30 grams in that case. Or you could even just use uh, the cuttings from having split the core in half off a diamond saw, in which case we're, we're getting up to appreciable types of sample masses, and also we're dealing with fine grain material. But the bottom line is, particularly for a low grade deposit, and, and sampling theory dictates that the lower the grade, the more mass we need to get a representative sample, that just using spot analysis alone is going to be, it's going to be very challenging to get a representative sample. And just to put this into perspective, if you're doing uh, ICP analysis these days, they, they typically, the labs will use half a gram. So, and that's after homogenization. So really, we're, we're about in here somewhere for a typical analysis. Uh, but if you're looking at something like soils or perhaps uh, rock chips from a percussion drilling program or an RSC <laughs> drilling program, the, the question you have to ask yourself, is it even worth going through calibration? Or if you're just looking for relative differences in your data, could you get by without a, uh, doing a calibration? Or even any sample prep? So I'll show you a result from a, a, a big project we did in 2011. We analyzed something like 15,000 soil samples from the Yukon. Uh, we didn't have time nor the tolerance from, from our employer to hold the samples up and do sample prep on, on site. So all we did was dry the samples and we analyzed them straight through the bag. Um, and it was quick and easy to do. And then they went off, they were going off to the lab anyway for analysis. So we weren't going to put a lot of effort in the field to, to getting the XRF analysis. What we wanted was an immediate, uh, some immediate information to tell us how we were going with the analysis. And if you're doing that, and if you're, if you're going to be shooting samples through, through the bag, you need to have a little bit of an understanding of what sort of an attenuation you're going to get from, from the material. So here is an example in the blue. This is a standard Oreas 45C analyzed directly, and here are the results analyzed through the sample bags that we were collecting the samples in and then going to be shooting the, the samples through. And you can see we've got a bit of a attenuation there, so you need to be aware of that. But again, it's not a problem because we're looking at relative difference from sample to sample. At this point, we're not interested in, in the absolute values. So I've just picked, picked one example out of a, a paper that we put together on this work that was published in uh, geochemistry, exploration, environment, and analysis. On the left-hand side, these are the ICPMS data that came back. The sample was sieved to minus 105 microns, and then analysis was done on a 30-gram sample. So quite a, in my mind, quite a good sample. And on your right-hand side are the portable XRF data, and we're looking at arsenic in both cases. And I challenge you, and I know it's early in the morning, 
Uh, but I challenge you to really spot the differences between those two percentile gridded images. So I use percentile gridded images because I'm not so interested in absolute amounts. I'm really, I'm looking for where the high arsenic is. And we're seeing it in the XRF data. We saw, that we saw it in the XRF data within a week of collecting the sample. Uh, and we had confirmation several months later when we finally got the lab analysis back. 2011 was a busy season up in the Yukon and turnaround times weren't that great. But the absolute values aren't too bad either. If you look at the percentile breaks on the lab data versus percentile breaks on the XRF data, uh, they're, quite, they're quite comparable. And really, the only difference is at the top end, the very, the very highest or most anomalous samples are a little bit different. Now, I'll move on to drill core and, and sampling. And sampling drill core is a little bit more challenging. Uh, what we did was uh, I did a study with the, uh, the help of Kiska Metals in Vancouver. And we did multiple spot analysis, both on the sawn side of the drill core and on the rounded side of the drill core. And note, uh, this is a, a measure of accuracy. So this is bias relative to the assays we had for that core interval. So you can see that the biases are different depending on which surface we analyzed, which was interesting. But by the time we got up to about 16 or 17 analysis, we were getting a reasonably accurate result. But we could get to the same point by doing multiple drag analysis. In this case, we did three drag analysis across each of the surfaces and plotted up that bias. And you can see that's pretty good. You know, we're within about plus or minus 10% of the actual assay value. And the other aspect is the precision. And as a measure of the preci precision, I'm using the coefficient of variation or the relative standard deviation. And again, didn't matter how many spot analysis we did, it was very difficult to get precise readings uh, from the portable XRF, but pretty good with the, with the drag analysis. So my conclusion is I, I wouldn't have a problem reporting this information. The, the, uh, the handheld instrument was calibrated. We had QAQC program in place. Uh, we've assessed both the accuracy and the precision of the data. So as a, as a QP, I wouldn't have a problem reporting this, these data publicly. Now, if we look at something that's a little more nuggety in its distribution, so uh, a similar style of information, I forgot to mention the previous example was from a porphyry copper uh, occurrence. And in this case, we have some coarser grain chalcopyrite in the sample. Doing the same thing, the, uh, the saw side, the rounded side, and again, we had to go out to about 20 plus analysis now to get an accurate result compared to, to what the assay was. And, you know, we're not too far off, but we're starting to see a little bit of bias in the portable XRF data from the drag analysis. And if we look at precision, we just never got anywhere close with precision. Even taking 20 analysis, we're still up with a, a relative standard deviation or coefficient of variation of uh, on the order of 170%. I don't think anybody would consider that acceptable precision in their data. Uh, we're a little bit better with the drag analysis. So my conclusion, I'd be very careful about publicly reporting this. And then finally, a, a, a different style of mineralization and also a different style of, of diagram. Uh, I've got the coefficient of variation, variation plotted in blue. And you can see, in this case, we're dealing with high angle veins, uh, molly veins. So the, the drilling's been at a high angle to those veins, and we're looking at, at the surfaces that cut those veins. So very difficult to use a surface to represent three-dimensional veins in drill core. But if we look at the coefficient of variation, you know, we're, we're not too bad in terms of precision, doing multiple drag analysis, in this case, three drag analysis. Uh, but the accuracies just not any good. We're 100% we're below what we should be compared to the assays. So there's no way you'd report this. But you have to do the work. You have to figure this out first. And uh, each project is a little bit different. Uh, I'm not a great fan of boilerplate uh, uh, QA, QC, and sampling protocols with the XRF. I think you've got to do the work. You've got to figure out what your accuracy and precision are going to be. And then from that, you, did, you derive your sampling protocol. And in some cases, you're just not going to get decent data. So it shouldn't be reported. It's just that simple. I'll touch on a few analytical aspects, because I think other people today will speak on this in, in more detail than I will. 
But it's important to select the right instrument. So you, you want to make sure you've got the correct anode for the project that you're going to be working on. Have you set it up correctly for the elements that you're going to be analyzing? And have you got suitable detection limits for the elements of interest? So what, what you often see, and this is going back a, a few years to be, to be fair to the manufacturers, uh, but you often see these limits of detection, uh, the LODs, uh, in this case comparing the, the old pin detectors against the, uh, the drift detectors, just to show what the limits of detection from the manufacturer are. But these, of course, are, are based on a pure silica matrix, so they don't include a lot of the interferences that you're going to see in real geological material. But you can actually work out your own uh, limits of detection from your own data. Uh, there's a few tricks to getting the data out of the machine. You have to set it up properly to obtain this information. But you can, you can actually work these out. You can calculate them. These were done on some soil samples. And then you can also determine what percentage of your samples are above that limit of detection. And you can see if only 4% of your sample population is above the detection limit for tungsten, well, it's obviously not a suitable detection limit or a suitable instrument if you're going to be analyzing tungsten. Uh, but for copper, we're pretty good. Uh, lead and zinc, we're pretty good. Antimony, not very good. Molly, possibly OK as a first pass. Uh, but something that's not really matched to all these different elements. Now, uh, I'll have to spend a minute explaining this. This is out of uh, the Camara program um, or study that was done on portable X-ray uh, handheld instruments. So we've got five instruments up at the top, three different elements that we're looking at in, in certified reference materials, different counting times now, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120. Uh, the study was done to see how the count times required to get reasonable data might vary from instrument to instrument and also from element to element. And you can see there's, there's a lot of scatter but at least here, you know, once we're past about 40 seconds, we're getting good precision. You can see the data starting to tighten up. So basically, precision is a function of how many counts you collect. It's a, a function of uh, the number of data you have to play with. And in this case, reasonably accurate. You, you may not even have to calibrate to use arsenic on this instrument. Uh, this is good, too. It's not accurate out of the box from the factory. But that's OK. The data are precise. We can apply calibration, and we can use calcium with a lot of confidence. This instrument, the data are, are all over the place. They're neither accurate or preci precise. Really, you can't do anything with these data. Now, accuracy, you need to monitor, monitor using appropriate certified reference materials. Uh, you want them to be matched somewhat, as close as you can get anyway, to the material that you're going to be analyzing. Here's an example for that program I showed you previously from the Yukon. Uh, we were running ORAS 42P as our, our routine standard. And you can see we've got beautiful precision and great accuracy. In fact, uh, there, we didn't even do a calibration for the arsenic. This was, these were the arsenic data straight out of the factory for this instrument. Uh, so, so really good. It gave us a lot of confidence in those arsenic values. And then it was validated one, once we got the lab data back as well. And you need to monitor this on a regular basis, just like a lab needs to monitor its, its ICPMS, just to make sure there's no instrumental drift over the life of the project. And you can see in this case, there, there really isn't. Uh, and then if you do a calibration, you need to be looking at uh, the XRF data plotted against the, the certified reference material data. Uh, and you want to see a good correlation, close to 1. Uh, you want a y-intercept near 0. And you want a slope close to 1. And then you know that these data, or this instrument, is calibrated and ready to analyze copper. So in summary, really, the, uh, I like the approach from Jork in terms of an underlying philosophy for reporting any data, including portable XRF data. The information needs to be material. You have to be transparent in what you're doing. And you need to be competent. Representative sampling is critical. If, if we don't have a good sample, then there's no point in worrying about the calibration or count times or running a, an extensive QAQC program because you're just fooling yourself. This, the, the sample is not representative of the material you're sampling. Um, really, it, it, it's all a bit of a waste of time. You have to make sure you have a, a suitable instrument. I've run into uh, a few companies that are using 
Uh, XRFs built specifically for gold analysis, but these are built specifically for gold analysis of jewelry, not for rock material. So they don't include any corrections or any matrix effects for geological materials. So it, it, it was an inappropriate machine for what they were trying to do, and they couldn't understand why the lab data didn't match what they were getting off their XRF instrument. If you want to report absolute values, you're going to have to calibrate. But if you, if you only want to show a map of relative values, you may not have to uh, calibrate or even do a lot of sample preparation. But again, you have to do enough work to give yourself confidence that it, it's all working. You need to have a, a count time that gives you uh, uh, sufficient precision. And again, you need to check that using some certified reference materials. And, and certainly, if you're going to be reporting data, you need to have a QAQC program in place. So that's all I have to say. Uh, uh, just one last word. I would like to, to thank Olympus and Innovex Canada for uh, jumping into the breach uh, when uh, the course was canceled by PDAC. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and to speak. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if we have any time left. What's the effect of moisture? Yes, moisture will have an effect, and that, that was something that was studied, I think, in phase two of the Kamara project. Uh, basically, you're, you're changing the, the uh, composition of the sample, so you'll reduce your values. Uh, but people have been analyzing quite wet samples, but again, they're, they're calibrating and accounting for that, so they're measuring the moisture of the sample, and then they can make a correction back to a, a dry analysis. Uh, but it does have an effect. And that's why the one thing we did on that Yukon case study was we dried those samples in a, in a drying tent for two or three days. We had to do that anyway because we were going to ship them out and there's no point in shipping water out of the Yukon. So what we did was uh, just dry them. And just before we were ready to put them in the, the uh, polyweave bags to put them on the plane to go out, they spent uh, a couple minutes on the portable XRF before they went out the door. Um, and, and that... That workflow worked pretty well, but I, I would always dry because trying to measure the moisture content to make the corrections is, is quite difficult in the field. Was the dry, drying in the sun adequate? Uh, it, it would if you, if you have sufficient heat. You, you just have to, uh, we didn't actually test everything. We, we sort of got them as dry as we needed to have them before we shipped the material off. Uh, we did in that case because we were having occasional rain as well. Uh, we air dried them for a few days, and then before they were going to be measured, we brought them into, uh, we took over the, the core tent, and, uh, which had a heater in it, and we put them in the core tent, and they sat there for at least 24 hours uh, before they were put across the machine. Um, but again, remember, you, you're only going to be measuring uh, the x-rays on the outer surface of the sample. So uh, the core doesn't need to be particularly dry. Um, just the outer rim of the sample, I'd say going in at least a centimeter should be dry before you analyze. Uh, so from your comments, I'd assume then at the start of a project or start of a new activity within the project, say drilling, you'd be extremely cautious about reporting anything until you have sufficient time to build the experience necessary to study your results from the XRF analyses to those of the lab. Short answer, yes. Yeah. I think, uh, like any geochemical technique, I'm a great believer in doing orientation studies. You, you have to figure out your material, your project. You have to do some cross-validation against laboratory data. Uh, and, and here's, but here's where you also optimize. So you can work out, maybe you don't have to count for 120 seconds. Maybe for, if you're interested in copper, maybe 40 seconds is going to be good enough. And if you're going to be doing several thousand analysis that that 80 seconds that you've saved on each analysis uh, is translates into a lot of time saved so that's that's where you that's where you can optimize everything you can figure out what's going on and then once you've done that process you'll know you're getting if you're getting reliable numbers yeah okay I might be confident to to report those publicly but if you haven't done that work you're taking a chance to, to release results I might wind up asking this question of a couple people today. I'm a mining engineer, so I, I haven't seen a lot of these uh, test programs in the field, and particularly for core. But you've mentioned the drag analysis as um, 
as a method of getting a maybe a more accurate or precise or whatever uh, um, measurement. And you, I think, set up to around a meter potentially for that for that interval for that length of drag. For somebody who's perhaps interested in that, what happens at the submeter level, the heterogeneity or the variability at the submeter level, do you see a lot of variation in, in core at that submeter level? And it might preclude perhaps the, the drag test, but I'm interested in that heterogeneity. Uh, yeah, that, I mean, that would be one of the things that you'd want to figure out in, in your orientation work. So, I mean, that, that comes back to how you're sampling the core anyway for if, if ultimately you're going to be doing lab analysis on it. So that basically is what, what should your sample interval be for this project and for this drill core. If you're, if you're sending it off to assay, what sort of sample length would you be looking to take originally? Um, so you could, you could break up your core into sample intervals. And, and uh, in fact, you could do this very quickly. And, and before you start to send stuff off to a laboratory, you could take it in, in short intervals, maybe. In fact, those, those examples were about 30 or 40 centimeters. Take 30, 40 centimeters in, in your core, break it up, and then compare results and, and see if you do have that heterogeneity. Yeah, I guess the, the issue that we find is that when you set, um, make a sample of, say, a meter or two meters or whatever and send mm -hmm. it off, you've already smoothed out everything that you want to know about the submeter yeah. level. Yeah. So it's just, in general, do you see heterogeneity that gets smoothed out uh, as a result of, of assaying? Oh, you would, yeah, certainly. Uh, I think, uh, for example, the, the coarse chalco pyrite example, there was a lot of heterogeneity in, in that. Uh, certainly the molly veins, a great example of very heterogeneous distribution of mineralization. So yeah, I mean, it, it's a great technique to investigate that heterogeneity in the core to get an understanding of how variable it might be over that, that standard sample width that you might be collecting for. And, and plus, you're getting a, an instant result, too. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question, and actually, it, it, was, it, was, it was part of uh, my question, and I'm realizing now how simplified my question is going to be on this. But, but roughly, rule of thumb, what kind of, what kind of times, let's say, we, you know, we've established a meter is, our, you know, mm -hmm. is, is appropriate, but how yeah. long would you do a, a scan? Yeah, well, I guess uh, that, that is, again, that, that protocol you've got to work out. But... Um, Look, doing it by hand isn't, isn't the greatest way to do it. And, and there are instruments, and I think you're going to hear about one today, where this whole process can be automated and controlled. And, uh, um, but you have to, the, the thing is, you, you set up a count time on your instrument, and you say, we're going, to do, we're going to go over a meter. So you might set your count time to 40 or 60 seconds. And then really the trick is, OK, I've got to get from one end of the core or one end of the meter to the other end of the meter at about one minute. So getting that rate of drag is quite tricky. We, we just did it by trial and error, and sometimes we'd get to the end of the meter and we still had 30 seconds left to count, so we had to scrub that analysis and go back and adjust. I think automating the process using robotics would allow you to control that, and I think that's one of the major advantages of using a, 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 an automated system for, for scanning core. Okay, thank you.